Pleasure to welcome Eric Parry uh, to the AA. Of course, Eric is no stranger. He is on the council, a graduate of the school, and uh, uh, I'm certainly looking forward to, uh, to this lecture. It's something that we've been trying to do for quite some time. I think uh, Eric is really, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but Eric is really a, a rare uh, person as far as uh, contemporary practice is concerned in, in the UK. Uh, because I think that uh, it's very hard to think of uh, really that many people who are able to combine uh, teaching uh, with practice. Um, there are a lot of people who of course practice and teach, but I think always there is uh, one side seems to be, uh, you know, taking to uh, to be the, the the sort of the more the, the more important part of uh, this equation, and I think what's amazing about Eric is that he carries both of these things, the the teaching and uh, uh, practice, 100% to the same level, at least until this year. So I don't know what's going to happen next year, but uh, this has been. I think this is very very unusual. Uh, what, uh, what Eric has been doing. I think the other thing is, is that uh, many people who teach, there is often a kind of uh, uh, certain kind of interruption between what they're teaching and what they themselves do in practice. And I think often what they teach in the school is maybe more interesting uh, than what they, uh, what they do in practice. I think that's the other thing that's quite unusual about uh, uh, Eric's way of working that really the, the work in the office has the same kind of aspirations and ambitions that are uh, often instilled in the kind of projects that uh, he's been uh, running uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the studios. Um, uh, Eric has been in uh, uh, private practice since 1983 and also teaching at uh, University of Cambridge uh, since that time. Uh, he is a graduate of uh, University of Newcastle and Royal College of Art and the AA, as I uh, mentioned and is a member of the Architecture and Visual Arts Advisory Panel of the Arts Council of England and is a council member uh, of the AA. Uh, apart from uh, lecturing uh, and uh, teaching at several schools in the UK, he has also taught studios at the GSD, Harvard, and at Tokyo Institute of Technology in Japan. Uh, Eric's work over the last uh, uh, 10 or 12 years has been exhibited in, in many places. Uh, he was part of the uh, very well known, I think, uh, exhibition in London, uh, the four London architects, in Paris, the Paris London, and at Harvard he was part of the Emerging European Architects uh, group. More recently his work has been part of the exhibition at the De Single uh, Gallery uh, in Antwerp. Uh, his research interests include urbanism in Europe and India, the iconography of materials, and the history and theory of modernism. Would you please join me in welcoming Eric Parry. Thanks very much, Moisen. Um, yeah, well, the reason uh, that it's possible to balance uh, these two aspects to some extent is uh, both because uh, the practice, the work in the practice, and, and some of the projects I'll show have been nurtured over a very long time, um, two particularly for 10 years. So there's uh, a long period of gestation. Um, and the other is, uh, is simply fantastic team of people with whom I am working and have worked, uh, we've been together pretty consistently f for that time. So it becomes very possible to share thoughts, ideas. Um, and it's grounded furthermore in uh, <coughs> roots here at the AA. And that uh, brings me to the title of the lecture. Which, which I've called city and substance. And in a way, um, I'm going to range in scale uh, from the large to the very small. Um, interestingly, when I, I was here being taught by Dalibor and, and by Moisen, indeed, um, it was a kind of period consumed by um, a thinking about the city. Um, and out of that time, the people teaching studios have um, 
contributed enormously to the shape of contemporary projects in, in Europe and, and America. Um, there is a question in, in my mind about the, the intention of a number of those, those schools of thought, um, and that's probably for a debate beyond this, um, this lecture. But I would say that uh, the work of, uh, of the practice is, is still um, very much formed by the thinking, the urban thinking that was in gestation at that time um, and continues in, in some studios at, at Cambridge. Whilst my own interests based in, in those urban concerns have moved towards the question of construction and uh, materiality um, and that is something that, that I will show. So I wonder if we could turn the lights down and I, I will begin. I, <coughs> I wanted to start with uh, a kind of idea of the um, monumental, monumental void um, and the question of the relevance of the monument in uh, one of our own small projects. But um, it, it seems to me, and we, we are making a small project in Kuala Lumpur, and it happened out of the office window that I could track these towers um, on my occasional visits um, through their, both their growth and uh, through the weather. So this indeed is the, the same view at different times of the day in the monsoon um, and in some degree clarity in the late afternoon. Um, the sort of sense of um, a, an, a, an empty excitement that exists in the, the, the building of the, the highest, tallest towers in the world, a kind of um, a continuum from Cesar Pelli's enormous projects in the States and here in London um, to a, an alien culture, um, an, a culture somewhat unsure of itself, um, but explosive um, for good in part and for bad more often. Um, and in, this, in, this, in the same way, one, one thinks of these, these uh, monuments like, for instance, the Tokyo Forum here on the left um, as, as objects of, uh, of desire, unrequited desire, um, awaiting their, their um, their soul that might be given, like the Eiffel Tower, um, by their acceptance or involvement in, uh, in the cultural context in which they're, they're built. These are very young, but I'm reminded yeah, also um, of, of this allure for Europe of, um, of those Buildings. This is Mendelssohn in 1925. His photographs of America, the, the, the Chicago Tribune Tower being built, and and very much like Toyo Ito's excited images of Tokyo. My my own last slide on the right. Mendelssohn's vision of the, um, as he calls it, the the excitement of of New York. Or to what I would uh, describe as a kind of lazy architecture. Um, here in uh, Beppu, in the south of Japan, uh, Izazaki's convention center, um, which is, is, a, is an enormous box in which um, the convention hall and the philomony here um, as an egg, a literal egg, um, the one-liner with masses of empty space um, around it, the same chairs that he's designed for his, uh, his library um, in Oida. Um, a kind of repetitiousness and almost um, a, bo a boredom in this, uh, in this expansive spatial uh, neutrality that's summed up in the, in the strange tower on the right, from which you get the very predictable views across the, the bay, which you might from the mountain, and this really strange entrance to the global tower on the right. Um, 
as it stands in, in perfect isolation. Um, I think I think the same you know can't be said for I mean there are, are brilliant buildings in 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 Japan of course and I just in passing um, look to um, this extraordinary building um, a monument a monumental building an, uh, an object building um, that sits at the entrance to the campus of the Tokyo Institute of Technolo Technology Shinohara's uh, Centennial Hall, um, with its very dense, s dense sense of compactness um, and expression, um, at the uh, at the entrance to the to the campus. This is an AA slide, and I hope that's not doing it too much damage. Um, in our way in the practice, we've been working with a small monument um, as a kind, as this is part of the Southwark initiative that was uh, started uh, by um, Southwark, um, Fred Manson and Ricky Burdett and the Architecture Foundation. Um, and the site we were actually allocated after shortlisting was um, the site at, um, am I getting I think this seems to have faded. I can walk, it's fine. Yeah. Um, is this site here at the base of um, London Bridge, um, which is a, is a kind of no man's line between Southwark itself and um, the boundary of the City Corporation and their building here. Cold Church House, um, which has been defined by, by traffic engineering, really. This conduit you can see is the connecting conduit, culvert, to the station um, that issues people out in the morning and sucks them back at night, um, ignoring the status of Southwark, so that the railway viaduct that cuts right across the edge of the cathedral um, bounds this space in one way, a kind of detritus of um, signage and confusion surrounds this area. And our first proposition was to do with the demolition of this. And in fact, it um, replaces um, a, or it was at the same time um, developed as a planning application subsequently rejected for a, a very brazen building that sat in the corner. We were suggesting this place as a place of orientation. Um, it's the place with the, the Jubilee Line and, and other, um, at, at Thames Link 2000, other linkages will see a great increase in tourism and people apart from those just moving to the city. Um, uh, the proposition was then to create a hotel. I mean, Westminster has something like 10,000 beds and Southwark barely 1,000. So uh, a hotel over a, over, a, over a meeting place for Southwark um, that would nonetheless leave this as a passage um, running under the building and onto the bridge. Um, thanks. That's great. Which has evolved, given that we have no rights over this building um, into a working with that very ugly broken limb. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Yeah, so that this, this wastage here, which has a brick wall, is now a proposal in planning, in, uh, for planning permission, which incorporates a point here, like a gnomon, um, in stone, post-tension stone, um, with these steps that break the balustrade, creating that point, and then, as a kind of resonance, creating this piece of hard landscaped area in front of it. Quietly um, playing with the, the obelisk on the other inside of the embankment, um, and indeed the monument itself. 
it becomes a point by breaking that passage, it becomes a point leading into this space um, and also a, uh, a point that leads with the demolition of the brick wall into an entrance and a tourist information center which hangs in the void created over Tooley Street so that you know the stratigraphy and history of London continues unabated here but unnoticed and this passage will then reconnect it down to that point in its primary way to, to Southwark Cathedral. The, the wall itself um, is seen as uh, a, a place that would be much alive. The pavement and the, the, the steps are reminiscent of the passage underground, a, a reminder of the stratigraphy. Um, this is Appiah's stage set for Orpheus um, on the left-hand side, and uh, one of his rhythmic pieces from 1909 on the right, and, and the water. The elemental quality, the very simple quality of these, of, of these amazing, um, amazingly strong passages from one horizon to another, which in a way evoked then and as a precedent some of the some of the interest in the dealing of the the weight of the landscape set against then this wall which would be become a uh, a project for um, a commission an art commission um, that would work by night and also with the adjacency of the, the large viaducts which will be themselves lit Um, Moisten alluded to, to, to that kind of thinking of, um, of experiment with material. I mean, the other thing is that dealing with the, the streetscape, it's intended that the hard landscape involving signage, because this will be one of the principal approaches to, to the Tate um, at Bankside and to the Globe and other, uh, other places in Southwark, is the, the sense of um, of street furniture, and that with um, the, the transitory nature of, uh, of the walls is something that we've been investigating um, in projects in, in, in the uh, diploma school at Cambridge. On the right, Alina by uh, Jose Estevez de Matos. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece that is sprung that is vacuum formed, that is fixed to the ground. It's about um, a waiting that isn't a seat, but it also has light in it and, and can be related to signage and a a advertising. And on the left, the kind of flea market piece um, by Peter Ferretto, the in instantly disposable box that has something to do with contraband. One of many projects. And I was reminded of the struggle of invention with material um, yeah, of the of the the art art project that uh, is imbued with material and 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 is involved at the same time with space sculpture. On on the right, as a, a, a an unsuccessful and very quick um, project with Richard Deacon for the Millennium Bridge, uh, a much more sculptural uh, piece than those that were chosen and shortlisted. Um, and other work that we have done collaboratively involves, for instance, at this chateau, which is one of the 10-year projects, um, to the, on one of the terraces, for instance, with uh, Stephen Cox, um, in fact, more with his workshop in Madras. Um, this is a, a, a table that started as an incredibly grand vision. Um, and got cut down through budget to a, a very simple idea, the slab of granite, which is used in Madras as a, as a, a border for, um, for fields, simply hewn from slabs. It is cleft naturally, sitting on these um, basalt tusks that are placed so that you can, you can put your feet under the table, and then the, the Stephen Cox vessels on the top.
and at the same time further yeah, collaborations here on, on a project that we are involved with in, in Seven Dials, which is the slow um, reconfiguration of the, the whole building, the, the Seven Dials warehouse, the, the Smith's Galleries, um, with retail on the bottom, which we don't have uh, an involvement with, but the a kind of urban building that will have a section that has uh, community use, has offices, retail, Belgos is here, of course, and then residential above it. Um, but the, 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 the scheme working with Vivian, Lovell, and Packer um, for the collaboration has been to do with the surface of this uh, space. And the shortlisted um, artists were uh, Anish, Tim Head, um, John Newling. Sorry, I got that wrong. Um, and uh, then I'm being John Newling, Sheila Wakeley. So um, I reverse that. And uh, Sheila's Sheila Wakeley's piece, um, which will is uh, developed from her rain squares. Um, this idea of silver foil laid on the ground, beaten by the rain into fragments, and then encapsulated and, and laid into a surface um, that will form that small space in front of the, the building. The, um, the question of, of substance and, and materials is one that follows the projects. Um, I'm, I'm not going back, but this is, uh, this is the building at Stockley Park, completed in 1991, um, where working from prefabrication and steel, um, the, the material was developed um, as a response to the instancy of the landscape, um, the lightness, the aqueous condition, um, and the idea of passage into the interior um, and addition, the conditions of uh, reflectivity and, and material that become more evident. Um, oh, damn. Sorry, I'm getting confused with these buttons. Um, and at uh, here at Sussex um, with the sense of enclosure that this is the continuation from in a way the the um, the Stockley building a passively controlled building with the same condition of uh, flexibility um, of, of, of being multi tenanted of a community building um, which is in a way an edge, um, an edge to a space, um, which uh, then, as part of that community, kind of breathes, uh, breathes through the passage and the, the centrality um, of, of the communal space in the middle. Um, and we, we are doing one more building now of that kind of an innovation an innovation center in West Lakes up in, in Cumbria, um, which is actually on site. But I come to the, the principal project for this evening that I want to describe. Um, and it is inevitably very much about the kind of uh, the tectonic, and I, I just want to, um, I want to go through and rehearse that, those issues in the building, but it starts clearly with um, its setting. Um, and I need to explain something of that and its growth. Uh, this, is, uh, this is on the left, the site, site plan of, of Cambridge. Um, the, the building here that you see is the, the, Fitz, the Fitzwilliam. Um, the main road that you know uh, probably runs into Cambridge and um, through here down to King's Parade and King's College. And this is effectively the line that 
circumscribed the town, what was once known as the King's Ditch, so that this college, Pembroke, lies just outside that. Um, it's a site that is uh, celebrating its 650th year of presence um, now, this year, and it starts um, here with this, uh, this corner, um, a foundress, uh, Marie de Valence, gave this piece of land and, and a piece of land in here, uh, an orchard, um, with a public building, a chapel, um, that you can, you can see as part of this structure here. So there was a court um, um, and a passage actually from the town to a public field, a swinecroft behind, which now would lie there. Um, so that, that cuts through the site here. Um, as it develops, the, the building here that is built is, is Wren's chapel, his first building. Um, and the lodge, um, which has a kind of nomadic existence over these centuries, starts at this point, uh, becomes part of a knuckle here. Um, and then as, as the building and the, the college expand, it's in the 19th century rebuilt here by Waterhouse, which is what you can see on the plan. Um, and he builds and breaks, breaks open this court so that you get this passage through to a library. So there are four buildings that he built, this, this accommodation block, a library, a dining space, um, and a new lodge. Um, and then in the, uh, in the 20th century, uh, in the 30s, that lodge becomes dislocated once more and is built as a kind of suburban villa in this corner here, um, behind a piece of land that is acquired from, in fact, an, an adjacent college. Um, it's marked by this enormous uh, band of trees um, and by, by the peripheral wall uh, that was built at that time, 1870, to separate the two. Um, the, the Cambridge is, uh, is, is a very fragmentary, frag fragmented kind of uh, place outside the institutions of the colleges. This image on the left um, is of the old schools which had a kind of weaker presence than the colleges and this, this facade, the Gibbs facade over the, the medieval buildings um, is typical of that relationship with the the buildings of the street, um, of the town, um, and the small scale of those beyond, and then this protective fence between the two domains. On the right is the late uh, 17th century description of Pembroke with the built chapel, um, and the adjacencies um, are of these gardens, uh, the master's garden here and the fellow's garden by it, and the tensions between the two that are evident historically. Um, but what's clear is that the landscape is incredibly carefully um, differentiated from the hard court to the formal gardens to the kind of arboretum of this orchard that lies beyond the buildings, behind the buildings. And that's something that has, uh, has very much disappeared in the, um, in the context of the, con the, the uh, the site has existed. Um, that's to say there's a sort of homogeneity and ubiquitous nature of the grass, of lawn, that has taken this over. And one of the projects I won't describe tonight is, is a project that uh, I hope we, can, we, we carry out for a small underground theater here, uh, which would return this space or make this space a hard court as opposed to the, to the softer landscape courts here. The site for the building that I'm going to describe is in here. Um, and it began as a process um, almost 10 years ago, so uh, in, in, in 1988, with a master plan um, that looked at the way in which the college, there is the scheme for this underground theater, uh, looked at the way, and the, the, the way in which it could expand the number of people um, who had accommodation on the site, uh, undergraduates particularly, who at the moment are in a kind of diaspora in, in lodgings around, around the town. Um, 
uh, this slide on the right is just part of that homogenizing process of the 1870s of the landscape waterhouse ripping out this extraordinary um, uh, a globe that was used for, um, uh, for experiment and uh, description of a kind of cosmic uh, presence. Um, the site then, just to repeat that uh, image uh, j and just to locate the new building, uh, having, having pre prescribed a sort of uh, the idea of the demolition of this building, 1930s building, that would perhaps have been happier in Wil Wimbledon, um, suburban all seeing, so there's nothing that could touch it. In fact, we did one scheme that uh, very, uh, very unhappily came uh, close to, to the building. It was clearly not going to work. Um, so the demolition became, was, was ultimately made uh, an acceptable uh, vision. And the, the, the disposition of parts that has emerged um, was set quite early, um, although this plan is, is, is as finally built, um, as a series of pieces. A, a, a new lodge, um, the fourth or fifth in, in the history of the, of the college, that began to re-engage with the fabric of the college and has a kind of town front and a college front, um, and is a buffer to a very unhappy uh, uh, collegiate lodge here as well. This is to Peterhouse. Um, this, the, the animosity between the two have, has been sort of rife since Waterhouse built the library absolutely cheek by jowl <coughs> with, with this garden, the lodge garden. And in, uh, in working through the legal constraints, never mind the planning constraints, it became clear that um, these, uh, the, 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 the fellows here, the teachers, had the right to block up these windows for whatever reason with three months' notice. Um, I don't know how English heritage would have seen that, but it was, it, it's, there's this kind of extraordinary tension in the, the land pattern and acquisition that exists here. This is the, the, the passage, the Vinella versus Swinecroft, uh, snaffled at some point in the collegiate history uh, from the town. Um, and then there is, on the other side, of a very small, uh, a small scale row of cottages. Uh, two stories high, and on this side there was a wall, or is a wall, a listed wall, uh, described by the planning officer as reminiscent of Brick Brixton Prison perimeter, um, which has, it's been possible to remove a kind of extraneous four foot from, but it still remains as a, a, an edge to the town, um, broken by a gate, a large gate um, to allow cars in and so on. To the to the court, the forecourt of the of the building. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of the the college is hugging uh, a perimeter um, a perimeter of streets, kind of congested streets. The idea here uh, was to pull the prime primary structure of this building, which is L shaped, um, back from the perimeter, so that um, it 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 provided a series of spaces. Uh, within, and I'm, I'm going to look at, a, uh, at some of the elements that make this building up as, as, we, as we proceed. Um, the, the basic uh, configuration then is, is this building here as a townhouse at one end, and, and a kind of expansion of the building to the perimeter wall at this end, just taking up the geometry of the street, and that creates a court in here. Um, there is car parking uh, yeah, underneath here on the ground floor and above this, just dotted here, is the, the sense of an upper court, a cloistered court. Um, another small court at this point and then, and then yet one more here. So a series of courts that dot the perimeter and create, therefore, a series of projections, smaller scale pavilions at this point and a, a gatehouse almost here. Um, that stretches back to a principal staircase. Um, the, the two sides then, this is just as part of the development, I shall leave the slide on the left on as I, as I, as I proceed with the description on the right hand. Um, but what then emerges is a kind of complex 
building made of very simple parts. Um, the, the room which I'm coming to um, is, is a room that is quite deep and quite shallow, um, a, a sort of an accepted minimum, really, for student accommodation, perhaps slightly bigger, but nothing like as grand as, as this is not a, a hugely affluent college, nothing like as grand as some, some of the collegiate uh, accommodation, and at the same time of a, of a better quality and certainly with the kind of finishes than, than other standards for, for student accommodation around the country. So it's, it's kind of between, in middling, as it were. Um, the, the parts that are then vertical, if you've seen the plan, that work vertically are uh, the staircase that I began to describe as a principal stair. Um, and stairs that split what are effectively almost separate buildings um, and create schisms within the building that let light through um, and break the scale so they're reflected here and here um, by the break in, in, the, in the roof structuring. Um, at this side there is an entrance, so the similar adjacency to the one shown in the Logan plan of the college is evident here with a master's uh, garden and a fellow's garden that kind of intertwined with, with a very tense connection through a gate um, and, and an approach that takes you through a pergola to, to, to this point. Um, the room itself then is part of a, a discipline, there are many, uh, there were many studies of, of rooms, um, but the basic configuration is uh, established as, as one with a, a five meter depth and, and something like a three and a half meter width. Um, and the struggle was to um, start to think of material, and I'll take you through that, um, and the differences that would have been possible or talked about. Um, and the, the condition of 60s buildings in Cambridge of three walls and, and the windowed wall into the landscape, um, quite close to the goldfish bowl um, at one end of the spectrum, very beautiful in in the more rural kind of uh, uh, situations, um, possibly. Um, and then, on the other hand, the typical room in a college which would be oriented the other way with two windows. Um, uh, and some examples of rooms that have, uh, have, have uh, established themselves around a singular window, kind of very dictatorial opening in a room that allows for no reorientation or subsequent settling, um, th they're very absolute, like the, uh, the Larson building at Churchill, for instance. Um, and here, one of the, the aspects that was, uh, that was actually useful in terms of the, the way in which the building responds to its, its setting was that uh, as an undergraduate building and not for you know, conferencing, or it, it, it removed itself from the tendency towards the hotel and more to a cell where there would be an, a minimal uh, space for storage um, and for washing, but that bathing um, is something that is, is not centralized, but is grouped in small pockets uh, around the building and, and refers, as I'll come to show in many points, to the courts and the, 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 the vertical landscape of, of gardens um, around the building. Um, the, the first... The first struggle then was with the question of brick or stone. And um, brick and a bay, um, two windows being a prerequisite. The idea of establishing, rather than um, the simple window wall and its, its uh, struggle with the scale of mullions and transoms. Um, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. Let me just, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I have the, this axo a bit later on. Um, this is going back to, to room studies of that period. And then, um, if I go back here, um, the question of, of whether this might, if defined in stone, how, how the articulation of the two windows, the deep window, tall window, to admit a lot of light, and the little window 
that might be um, uh, a way of um, yeah, a way of lighting a wall that is closable, so it becomes either wall or window and is more ambiguous, uh, was something that uh, was struggled with. That jam detail that you see uh, here, incidentally, is about the dimensional kind of characteristics of the room. That is to say that where the, there is the corridor, there is a large architrave, a heavy architrave of wood. Um, where it comes to the room, that dimension becomes a bead because it's evident that to maximize the space, the bed can either be placed in at this point or this point in the room. Um, and that means that the door has to be inserted close to the wall. And as such, you can't create an architrave. So to the common parts, there's a, there's a generosity in, in the, big, um, the big section of wood. Um, and then uh, beyond that, less. The next question, having identified the idea of stone to define these openings so that each room, and there are, there are uh, variations on this, but each room effectively is a very simple post and lintel creating an idecule within which the two windows are and then this translucent panel below, um, was the way in which the window might, might operate here an early sketch to show the planners, actually, um, that suggested a, a sliding window. Um, clearly, the question of the amount of material forming the window, the metal, um, was a, an issue because when you start to think about a room that um, is working with a very minimal heat source and heavily insulated, um, the windows play a part in that. They become you know, double glazed, um, heavily sealed, um, and consequently, the the vision, the modern modern movement vision of a of a, of a minimal came or transom or mullion um, becomes uh, becomes something that's uh, very difficult to 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 contemplate. And um, this sh this should have uh, followed that that idea that this is the door jam detail that was here. The heavy, this is a model made at 1 to 10, um, investigating the kind of sequence of the room. The, the floors are in, in, a, in, a, in an oak, like a, just a carpet of oak, and then these heavy frames and a very rough plaster uh, to the corridor. Um, coming into the translucent window below, and the furniture and the desking has been designed to work with this, um, you then have a sequence that uh, we're returning now to, to the equivalent of, um, if I just go back to the sliding window, the idea of a pivoting window, None, neither of which were adopted. This, interestingly, because it would have broken the, the, the consistency of the facade that was established um, with its rhythm of the wider pier of stone taking in that kind of ablutions back-to-back -back niche and the thinner piece creating a, a rhythm across, across, the, across the facade. Um, develops here in, it developed, and this is where the small projects, the thinking of materials, the smaller, smaller projects come to bear on, on the larger. Um, this is a, 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 an extension to an, a house with, with, a, with a, uh, a working of the interior at the same time, reworking. Um, in, in uh, St. John's Wood um, uh, and the Honzig uh, precedent, I mean entrance, garden entrance here, um, that is echoed in the interior um, by the opening of the doors. Uh, the corner here you can see slides away and starting to work with the stone, the heavy, the heavy elements of stone, the stone court, um, uh, sorry, I, I, I go on too fast. Um, the stone court and the mullions, the thickness of mullions, the sliding sections um, as something that gave a high performance preceding the Pembroke job uh, effectively gave rise to a nervousness uh, about those, the scale of those sections. Um, 
which are, are heavy. So any kind of breakage in this, this is, these are very tall, they're six foot tall um, by just under five foot wide. Um, so that uh, any breakage of a transom in that glass becomes very difficult to cope with because of its scale outside, given that the frames are recessed. As developed, this is a, a, f a window that will tilt and will turn. Um, and the same is true of the smaller window. This is obviously the model still. Um, and at the same time, then, the thinking about the stone and the window <coughs> opening so that uh, fully open, it gives a very, very close connection to the garden. With this as a window that can be, uh, its bottom pivoted so it can be cleaned from the inside, uh, as can this, so they can all, all uh, have that, uh, that, that capacity for low, low maintenance. Then, critically, came the problem of, of how to deal with stone in a, a kind of 20th century building, um, and, and indeed in weathering, and that was something that was very much part of the thinking here, uh, with a secret gutter in order that this doesn't become a kind of weep, a moustache. I mean, one could show images of, of buildings where the intention hasn't been thought to the weathering, and, and that water here is gathered and runs down a secret gutter behind here, which is also on the interior, the place where the, where the curtain will bunch that pulls across this window. Um, the other is a, a wooden uh, shutter that works with the joinery of the interior. Yeah, so in very clearly the, uh, the experience of, of this building with its very heavy base, I mean these steps, there are only three of them, but they, they are simply massive pieces of stone. Uh, the top step is some 600 high by, uh, by 300 wide. Um, just just a monumental kind of thinking, very close. I mean, you know, it's whatever it is, uh, 10 years from, from, from the Appia um, work in Switzerland, um, which I, I'm sure Tarani is probably aware of. Um, and then the, the frame um, and the sense of humanizing the industrialized vision or the technological vision of many mo modern movement buildings, perhaps by the, 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 uh, the cultural continuity offered by the sense of material in the stone. So uh, it's, it is extraordinary to find these lintels um, that are very thin, but are, are something like four meters wide, massive lintelled elements on the, on the kind of trabeated, simple tra trabeated frame. Um, part of the, the struggle with with those lintels, which are, uh, are uh, 11 foot long at Pembroke, is the kind of stone that would be capable of, of establishing those lengths in the thinnesses of a stone that is not load-bearing, but uh, is, is not, at the same time, a cladding. It's a self-supporting, it's a skin, it's a celebration of a skin that gives that depth um, and, and comes in, in very large pieces, which reflect, ultimately, um, the way in which the stone is procured and mined. It's a bath stone, um, and it's a stone, it's a, an English limestone, which is capable of being cut into those lengths, although soft. And the other, perhaps, is the way, I mean, this, uh, this incredibly sophisticated use of, perhaps reluctantly, of stone, um, but something that was re required of the Smithsons at The Economist, um, using the roach bed Portland stone with its figuration um, and the extraordinary attention to detail with the drips and the courses, the aluminium um, courses that uh, provide drainage down the edges, again, thinking so carefully about, about the weathering. Um, and so that's the way it, it now is. Um, here, the thin stone pillar uh, that divides two rooms, the tall window, the translucent panel, the, the, the small panel here, and the large lintel, um, which at 11 foot is allowed, or it's the expression of its movement expansion is, is clear in these joints. Um, and, and here the depth, some 500 millimeters back to the, the window, um, can be seen 
working in the between from the lintel back to to the window the window frame and its condition there typically with uh, a basement clerestory that under, underlies this so that the weathering point is through here and issues onto the, the surface. Here I just will describe under construction the, the various courts. Um, again, this axonometric, um, you can then see a small court to the south, which is made up of the two-storied pavilion and a penetration so that the building is open underneath this point, um, coming into a court that is raised above the street level and that road has a tree, a teaching room, uh, a typical bay of rooms, and then a, a, a flat uh, for a graduate above that here. Um, it uses uh, a York stone and, and a French limestone, an oville, a, st a stone called oville, which is also used for the base of the building, a harder wearing uh, stone than, than the bath stone. So you have the passage from the outside here from the court running into this small space um, that looks like this. Um, here's the way through. Um, here is, will be, a glass canopy, a two-story glass canopy passage in its south facing. This is the listed wall. There's a, an element that grows up here to break the length of this wall um, and work with the orientation between the perimeter wall and, and the geometry of the building as a whole. Um, and at this point, there is, there's a small water piece um, uh, facing the other side, a bench in a, in a, in a very strong ceramic, um, and then a, a, a vertical garden on, on the wall. And the same court, uh, just looking at the, the, the typical bay south facing with that passage through there. The, uh, there is a sort of uh, a, a, a very austere character to this facade, which is, was intended actually to be masked by two trees that have since been felled uh, because they were diseased. But what you have is this tripartite uh, opening, which is to a very deep room, a 14-meter room, which is a, which is a, a college uh, room, as it were, here on the first floor, um, and the passage, a kind of porch, the passage into, uh, into this building, which is strange in terms of a dwelling house, because it's, it's both institutional, uh, working to the college, and is domestic uh, for, the, for the principal of the college. So it has a sort of familial side, which is this morning room here, and, and a space back behind there. Um, and a staircase in the middle of that running back here, you can just see it, which is a domestic, a timber-lined stair um, that connects to this big room through a, an opening over a fireplace. This is top lit. Um, and the stair that moves in here is one that is kind of ceremonial, brings you into this space, takes you down into a dining space that <coughs> relates to the exterior. So the, um, the, the facade here reflects that, the, the morning room, this bedroom's above, and then these large openings to this drawing room that runs through at this point. Uh, with a, a very hard surface in here, those porphyry, Italian porphyry sets, so there's a kind of ochre surface against which this, this, this works. And on the back, um, there is the uh, facade that works to the college with a a series of uh, opening doors that open up, looking into the garden, um, and on the ground floor, these windows to a dining space, which is described as, as earthy, hard, uh, and architectural. So um, this passage comes out to, to a space that is garden, and, and here there's a, there's a garden walk that penetrates the building from the other side to, um, to this, so it's directly opposite this. So when you open this door, you see through to a, um, a glass door and into the garden uh, with uh, finishes the way. Well, actually, the finishes in the interior are completely separate conversation for another time when they are more complete. Um, now I'm moving the wrong way. Um, there is 
the, the structuring of this relates to another small project that we did to rehouse some accommodations and gardening, a c conservatory, it's a greenhouse. Um, there's a double structure that gives a recession and then the clerestory is placed further back again with the, the domestic part that can expand or contract with the college. So, um, so that, is, that, is, that is here um, with one of these stair cuttings that have small shared kitchens on this side and the stair on the other. Stairs are made in, um, to reduce the waste in a metal soffit that is suspended within the walls, the rough, the rough plastered walls. Um, and, and from this point is a room, given that all the ground floor rooms are raised a meter above the floor to establish, to establish a kind of privacy to these, to these rooms, if you can imagine that. At this point, and underneath, there are, there are large, there is, there is an exercise room, computer room, a large music room, uh, and a plant room, and so on. But here, the slab drops again. Um, and what you see as a, as a builder's passage at the moment through those two openings is, in fact, uh, a room that uh, will be um, this part of the, part of the, uh, the financing for this was, was by agreement with uh, Tokyo University, the Nihon University in Tokyo. And this room is going to be a shared common room for the two, two parties. Uh, the furniture is being designed by, um, and it, it has to, to, to work in many ways by uh, uh, some friends, some, the, the Azumis who were at the Royal College, furniture designers, a very beautiful pieces that, uh, that can be both a, a, like a club chair or a support to a table to provide the different orientations or, or configurations of the room. Um, but this room will connect the inner court, which is a garden in the tradition of, of court gardens here, open, and this small enclosed dry court, which has an opening to the street. So as you, you pass down here, you see through this into, into the court. Um, and where there are larger rooms, the ceiling height is, is taken. So, for instance, the basement disappears in the lodge so that the ground floor and first floor rooms gather an extra uh, foot and a half in ceiling height for those big spaces, which, which are the depth of 14 meters and so on. Same is true here, this 12 meter space, so it's 12 by 7. Um, the, um, the other one is above this gatehouse, which I'll come to describe, which is a student common room, um, which I'll come to describe in a minute. Um, above here, then, above the car parking, which is made in sets, and there's a bridge. It's a root bridge, actually, that goes from a, a passage here into the space, is this cloistered garden, so that the rooms become one layer thick rather than double banked. and. Uh, the, the space is like this. This will be a dry bed of pebbles. There are three openings, an oculus to provide light, sorry, that's there, to the car park below, because it's a continuous passage uh, underneath. Um, a bed for reeds uh, and a bed for a maple tree. So there's a tree here and a tree here that are kind of echoing each other with a glass solarium that goes over the top of this and separates the stone of the wall to the street from the stone of these idacules. Um, and then floating in this is a glazed translucent uh, piece, which are the showers uh, with, with clerestory light, so that this piece floats within the reflective garden at the center, a kind of cloister at the first floor. And you can just see through now to the gardens beyond and this in incredible strength of these plane trees at 100 foot that run down create the barrier between the two parts of the college. Um, this is the external corner, and as we go around, um, you come to this court, which is the little court here. There's a tripartite elevation here, um, with one passage that takes you into the stair. The stair runs up three steps short of the first floor, and therefore into a room again here that takes use of that extra height. So um, that is passing through here and up the staircase and into this room above here. Um, and this, the, the court is very simple with a kind of vertical garden established around the back of this wall. Um, so it's on the other side of the little court I showed before. 
Down the street then, this is the fragmentation, the, the two-story pavilions, the larger block here. You're looking at this flank wall here. Um, this gateway and then the break for this court and the flank of this wall. So whilst it's complete to the college, it becomes, um, it becomes revealed in a very different way to the, to the street. Um, there was a long struggle with the kind of characterization of this. The corridors ventilate through this lantern. And um, in, the earliest, uh, in the earliest scheme, let's go back, um, the characterization of that was with a turning, um, turning element that would help that aid that ventilation, which is disproved. And there, was a, there was an idea here for uh, a, a, a cut um, sundial with a gnomon that is a very simple two meter stainless steel rod um, and so this wall this piece becomes a reflection of time and, and the elements and I'll come to describe the lantern in a second this is then these are the lines that will be cut uh, originally conceived in kind of ignorance as an oval wonderful lines that just relate to the orientation of the building 10 degrees off due south um, um, and within that, the time frame that is then modulated with something called the equation of time for the wobble on the Earth by amoebas, a curve that you can read here to just establish that. So this will be a very simple device on one side, and then above it, I'm sorry, this is the wrong way around, but above it is this lantern that at one time had an element, a disc to allow this uh, ventilator to rotate, which was proved to be totally un unnecessary. Here is the the gateway then with this large student room. It doesn't look at much this way. It actually looks laterally, so there are views into this as you pass down the street. This element is canted, as you can see, so you see through into this little court or see up into this space. Um, and from the room itself, you see down the street and down the street here. Um, and this, the thinking about this was that it might have something that rotated with, that, with the passage of wind um, as a model form. As this developed, we worked um, with uh, Peter Aldridge, who was the professor of glass at the, the college, who uh, established through, it is, you know, through the sense of figuration of this hexagonal <coughs> piece, um, a, a glass, a very pure glass called um, Starfire. Um, and when you think, this is 15 millimeters thick and lends stability to this structure. When you think of 15 millimeters of glass layered up three or four times, it would be incredibly green and, and very, very um, uh, translucent rather than transparent. And within this will just hang, immobile, uh, a series of plates of glass in the form of a triangle, separated one from another 20 down or so, or so which are diachroic glass so that the light the effect of the light will change with the orientation and with the level from summer to winter um, and obviously with the strength and the coloration will just be seen through this, uh, this, this piece. So to the town then and as an orientation point there is the gnomon and the sundial um, and this piece that reflects the strength of, of light. Um, this is it being lowered from the college side and its structure it's quite it would have been quite feasible to actually have made that as a single sheet but because of the striation the, the balance and the, we were very nervous about how much or how little structure there should be in the end I think it's about right it kind of relates slightly bigger than the stone coursing um, these are the stainless steel frame incredibly flexible before the, before the glass immobilizes it and then the pieces that come together create its stability. Then the thing about this building, because uh, it is multi orientated in, in a complex way. It's orientated to town, uh, to, town to college. Um, it's orientated through the gardens and it responds to a kind of uh, a territory that has accrued a richness over time. That every room has uh, a very different 
setting and suggestion of landscape, and obviously light quality and so on. Um, I'm just showing one, um, but you can you know, feel that um, in relation to the kind of conception in the beginning of what that might have been. Let's just move that back. And um, yeah, a sort of sense of stone, um, the material, the passage, and the balance of transparency against the condition of creation of war. In a building that uh, is kind of at once terrifying when, when, when thinking about the simplicity of the project, because it's a, it is, it's a, it's a repetitive accommodation building, um, on the one hand, um, and the necessity to tailor it to give that minimal dislocation that responds to, to its placement against those enormous uh, buildings, the object buildings in a way that live by their, their, their kind of monumental void. Thank you. Questions and maybe I could uh, start with with one question just to get um, the the thing that that's I mean I think this this point about uh, city substance in terms of the description of the whole project in relation to the uh, the city itself is is very clear and I know you've you wanted to focus on that one thing that I think would be uh, very good is you alluded to the different elements of the project in terms of the common room and the courts and, and so on. It would be great if, if you could maybe say a few words in terms of how the college actually um, discussed with you the life of these dormitories. Because I think uh, it would be interesting whether this kind of city substance has uh, an impact in terms of how living in this version of Pembroke, for example, is different than other colleges. I think there, there must be some sort of stories involved mm -hmm. in, in, in that. Could you mm -hmm. elaborate on? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's quite opaque because, um, um, because you're faced with a, a buildings committee that um, I think there's only one surviving member, actually, uh, in terms of the passage of time. And um, there's a sort of veil of secrecy. <laughs> Ten years <laughs> from the master plan um, exist on the committee, I should say, and uh, the veil of secrecy is one in which there's a there's a sense of extraordinary sense uh, that I've never witnessed in in other projects of of caring on the one hand, and then a kind of confusion on the other hand. I mean, there's this deeply embedded um, sense of responsibility for this site, and at the same time, um, uh, there's a confusion about uh, what contemporary architecture might be. I mean, there's Quinlan Terry down the road, um, you know. Uh, so, it, for instance, the struggles over the nature of a window, a modern window, is kind of, uh, is, is not an easy one. Um, but the, 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 there were certain moments of clarity and then a lot of discussion. The clarity was that this was never going to be a, a building that would be used to uh, engender a f an, a, an income, like a conference, like a kind of hotel, like something. It had, it had more gravity in a way than that. It was the only time they could build on this central site, and it was seen in the tradition of a kind of uh, quasi, uh, I mean, a, qu a place of quietude for study, ultimately. I mean, there's no, you know, whatever um, else is there. Ultimately, this is an accommodation building, not a monumental building. Uh, with community parts, part, and each is, is a shared part. I mean, whether it happens to be the washing, the corridors, the common rooms, the lodge with its kind of ambiguous nature of uh, being a short tenancy, actually. Um, so it's really a collegiate building. Those were made clear, but not really more than that. Uh, I don't know if that goes to... It's very specific. I mean, it's, um, you know, it is... It is um, it is specific in that the college represents a continuity uh, and a continuum um, with this uh, sense of um, a lack of kind of in individual status because of the power of that 
that defining uh, circumstance. So it's a lay... I mean, there were allusions to buildings that could have been configured in a more informal way as garden buildings, like the Beguinage buildings, um, and separated, and there's this residue of that. Um, so they could have... And that might have been um, more relevant for, for graduate building. I mean, we're not doing any other buildings of, 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 uh, in, of collegiate kind. So this is a one-off. But we did get a planning permission for three houses, graduate houses, where the community is much smaller and more defined. Um, this is a building for 100 undergraduates, plus graduates, plus fellows, plus, you know, blah, no, I meant blah. it in terms of also the way that the graduates, for example, come together, the kind of new social formations that the, that the building, in a mm -hmm. sense, engenders. Mm -hmm. Somehow the mm -hmm. organization of the rooms, the kind of corridors that mm -hmm. it has. Is it, is it possible now to think with these colleges that somehow one, also in, in building a building like this, one actually also in some way tweaks or transforms mm -hmm. yeah. the, the nature of that kind of interaction that happens in the college itself. Yeah, well, we, we, now we touch on, on um, subtleties that may be slightly arcane, but, uh, you know, there, are, there is this tradition of, of building rooms around staircases. And um, that is with the largesse of a, a fa facade that can have the two windows and a, and a, and a, a, a less deep plan. But it comes to it becomes clear that to, uh, that to reorientate the rooms, you get another 30% of rooms on. So there's, a, there's a, a kind of charge there. But also that the length of these corridors have a kind of dignity, but they're broken. And, and the, the knuckles are the places of, of re-establishment of those small groups of rooms around a kitchen or... You know, so I haven't shown the interiors, but that is, that's the way it's established. So it's a different scheme to the traditional scheme of a series of isolated stairs around which on each floor you would get, say, three or four rooms. Um, so it has that difference, and it, it has that sense of, uh, of bleeding that isn't present in, in the more traditional yeah, form of, form of uh, structure. say McCormack at Wadham, where he might be thought to be more, have been more adventurous than you insofar as he tried to create a street at Wadham in a similar Jacobean context. So which of the more recent examples of collegiate buildings do you admire and why? I think, I think uh, we cast back, actually, to, um, to the 60s. Because it seems to me there's an, it's been the, 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 the uncertainty of the 80s in terms of the question of language and grammar was such that there was an extraordinary confusion um, in the way materials were used. So that an external skin um, to a cavity wall was treated um, as something that appeared or was apparently load-bearing. I'm not, not talking about the extremes. Um, blue Bur McCormack's Blue Ball Court, for instance, and a number of the other collegiate buildings seem to me strange in that allusion to you know, brick and stone and solidity, continuity through the wall. Unlike, for instance, uh, buildings of a graduate kind, so maybe a less formal kind, outside the city um, setting, like Clare Hall, the Erskine building, where brick is very, very clearly used and defined as a, as a skin. Without, a, without the attributes of, 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 of load-bearing. Likewise, we look, say, to the Paolo Moya um, Crips building at St. John's, a very beautiful building in many ways, but it, it, the wall is gone, so the sense of definition is, is ambiguous. And the rooms have this strange orientation of the blank back and flanks and then the, the large picture window they, they don't actually work in, in thermally in, in, a, in a terribly useful way, and the lintels become, you know, they lose that, that condition of scaling, to my mind. So, but, but there's many lessons to be learned from the brilliance of uh, a section, for instance, on the Arab building, whatever one might think of the, the conclusion, the Dowson building at Lechampton, a precast concrete frame that stitches an in situ floor structure. I mean, these are brave, interesting buildings, it seems to me. 
Um, but I don't think we had a contemporary building to look at. Now, I mean now of the 90s, um, it was much more reappraising a, a tradition um, and a sort of a sense of the way that the material might be used, given that there is an assumption that this building would, like many of the other buildings on the site, uh, last uh, you know, a quarter of a millennium before whatever. You know, so, so we were given that as a specification, whether it achieves it or not. Um, yeah. Well, there's a legal lifespan and there's a, a potential lifespan. But, but what, well, you know, there are buildings that are being refaced that are 650 years old. So, you know, there's a structure that exists for that time. Um, there's a skin that won't last that time but can be reconfigured. But it is expected, I presume, that it will, it will kind of continue for the same length of duration as, as those first buildings have to now in some guise. Well, that's the assumption. Um, which is, you know, you take the Ministry of Sound or a Stanhope, um, you know, the, the offices uh, for Stanhope already destroyed. Um, and it's uh, simply a, an interesting parallel with uh, practice in other, in other circumstances. Um, you said, you said uh, something about the stone not being structural, but at the same time not being cladding mm -hmm. in the thin sense. Mm -hmm. um, could you enlarge on what that median ca medial category Yeah, in, in it's, it's a skin that is self-supporting. And, and there's a long kind of technical issue that uh, is part of that. Because the, the building is a cellular building with acoustic separation between. So unlike the Tyranny, for instance, which is a frame, this is a cellular kind of egg crate. Um, which means that uh, what you see, if you look at the lintel of stone, is very clearly the expression of the stone as a limited depth. Um, and behind it, there are pieces. And very, very consistently, that depth is expressed in the joints, and the joints are, um, are, are broken and not bonded um, and run vertically. So it is, it is a skin that by simply trabeated means creates the, the recession. Um, with those lintels pitched on a structure that runs separate to the load-bearing structure. I mean, there are pragmatic issues too. It meant that the building could be built as a slow build because it's all the plaster, the thing has to dry out. It's, it's kind of, you build a wall, you place a concrete slab, you build a wall, you have to plaster it. Um, and if you were doing that with the progress of the skin as an element of that wall, clearly it would double the time of construction and, and uh, create a great difficulty. So the skin actually emerges or has emerged quite quickly relative and independently of the building being, being in the dry. But I mean, in that respect, it, it follows um, an idea, I think, of the applied skin or the self-supporting applied skin that you might find as facade, I don't know, in, in the uh, Sinai Franz of Prieni or, you know, of the Tirani building, where it is the expression of the material rather than necessarily than it, its structural performance that is implied. I mean, you, you seem to want an aesthetic that got beyond mere laminating, as it were. Uh, that, that's what I got. Yes, I think it's very interesting to, to uh, reflect on actually, you know, um, the use of stone and the modern movement, you know, Corb saw himself as a kind of man of stone in a way, in his atelier, you know, dressed as a workman. Um, there's this incredible variation of use of stone from cladding to cyclopean uh, masonry. Because of it, it like a palette, it has, it has an amazing, I had, you know, actually the last lecture I gave him was more about that palette. Um, but it, it seems to me that there is a story about the use of stone um, that is not so much whether it's authentic in terms of veneer or otherwise, but relates to the, 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 the condition of stone, um, the materiality, simply the sense, the presence of, of the material. And certainly in this instance, every student, there's a kind of celebration of that room 
with the singularity of the lintel that's 12 foot long that reflects also the way in which stone is cut, I mean, which is, you know, the quarries, the mines, this comes from a mine. And when you see the Victorian process of cutting the stone, it, it, which is called a stall and pillar, so you have pillars of sto stone you cut, leaving these great massive bulk ceiling. And uh, that was done manually by cutting behind. So the definition of the slab was the saw blade that you could get behind and you hacked the top away to get that through. Now it's sliced, you know, with a, uh, a forklift. And you can, you, so you get these big pieces that are actually much more economical to use, uh, but have nothing of the sense of the, uh, yeah, the, the panel of stone that is a prefabricated element, element um, that is a veneer. Um, that would imply a very different stone as well. And purposely, this stone, as a bath stone, is not a Portland stone, which carries with it a connotation of, of uh, monumental sense of period of kind of English Baroque, you know, in, in, in Cambridge. This is an ordinary building. It's a stone that, although it appears quite white, mellows to a, something between the two. Um, so the con yes, the kind of type, the way it weathers, and the way that will weather with the idacules was very important. And a substantiality uh, without it necessarily being part of the structure was the other, was the other kind of condition. of their relationship to the seriality of the rooms, then they then establish a kind of rhythm as far as the outside is, is, is concerned. To what degree uh, do you feel that things like the lintel, are, are, they, are they sort of, do, you, do they have necessities in the same way that the window relates to this, both conditions of the outside and the inside, or there's, because there's a point at which the notion of the repetition of the frame on the outside, and is that a necessary? Do, do you feel? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't. Is that a necessary thing for you? Um, because that's where you also make the link in some way to someone like the Rani. But is that to do with the constructional side of it? Is it to do with the the figuring of the facade itself? Where is the lintel necessary? It is. I th I think. <coughs> Yes, I think that if, if there's, a, there's a kind of question of uh, gauging the horizontal and the vertical and the individual. As soon as you establish, you cut the lintel, if you establish the vertical sequence of facade, which is typical of the, the Paolo Moya building that I was talking of, um, you establish a, a, a sense of community around the vertical. And this is much more of a kind of horizontal notion of corridor um, broken by the verticality of the stairs. So, in fact, it, you know, it is to do with the, yeah, the balance of the vertical, um, the incision set against the horizontal, and that that the horizontality and the way that that is broken critically by the stepping of the slab for bigger rooms, um, or the stepping actually of levels between pavilions and the centre, becomes a way of gauging the building. So I th that horizon was in incredibly important in. in suggesting a, a, a building or a sequence of parts of a building of this kind in the figuration. Um, not so much necessarily as frame, but by, by floor. The, the thing looked not so much like a supporting skin, a self-supporting skin, but like a frame. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the recessed panel in the window. That I found sort of a little bit confusing in your story. Mm. Did you see what I mean? Because you, you're looking at something which is trying to look like a, s a self-supporting skin, but it's also being expressed as a, uh, as a frame, an egg crate, you know, with a recessed panel behind, mm -hmm. almost like, say, a Chico Chicago skin or something. Yes, uh, whether it's, f I think it's piers. I mean, th these are w sections of wall. There's a spine and there's a, a wide wall. Yeah, but you feel the and cross wall or whatever it is coming through onto the facade, mm -hmm. which is not quite consistent with the self-supporting facade. But I don't know. I think that's mm. where some of the uneasiness comes from. Well, it responds actually. You know, it's a, there's a condition 
of separation between the rooms, which is given by that depth. But when you come to the street, it, it actually becomes a wall. So the openings are simply cut in the return to the room. And it's actually, it's almost like a sense of um, mediation between one circumstance, the town, and the interior. Um, so it's used in, in about five different ways. I mean, you, I, you know, from when there are a set of circumstances where it, 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 it modulates in relation to, to those things, uh, where I think, it, therefore, it makes sense, because without it, you don't have the difference. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks.